Hello viewers and good morning. Happy Sabbath. We are so much grateful to our Father for the six days of the week and bringing us once again in this holy Sabbath. We are so much glad and happy to be in this holy day of Jehovah. And we are told to be glad and always rejoice in the house of the Sabbath. Uh, this is M3A Medical Missionary Sabbath School Lesson. And our Sabbath School Lesson, we have been handling uh, the foundation of our faith by Helen Stamp. This is the foundation of our faith as Adventists. 160 years of Christology in Adventism. I believe you've been following the Sabbath School Lesson. And today we are going to continue with the chapter number 15. Last Sabbath we handled chapter 14. Today we are handling chapter number 15. And the chapter number 15 is entitled The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God. And uh, beloved, today we are going to look at biblical understanding of the Holy Spirit of God. Why should we first have the biblical understanding of the Spirit of God before we consider uh, from the testimonies and even from the pioneers' writings? We need first to be grounded upon the Word. And when we are to explain our faith, it is prudent to first look at it from biblical perspective alone. Let me pull a quotation here before we pray to look at the Holy Spirit of God in this our today's Sabbath school lesson. In the book uh, Prophets and Kings, page 626, paragraph number one, it says that God calls for a revival and reformation. What God calls for today is a revival and a reformation continue to say that the words of the Bible and, and the Bible alone. So the words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. So as we discuss the Sabbath school lesson today, this is our Holy Sabbath, God will want us to first validate and uh, come up with doctrines from the Bible and the Bible alone. And we are told that the words of the Bible and the Bible alone should be heard from the pulpit. But the Bible has been robbed of its power. And the result is seen in a lowering of the tone of spiritual life. So that standard must be raised. The book of Evangelism, page 456, we are told let there be a revival in Bible study. So Bible should be studied. And we need to be grounded upon the platform of truth from the Bible and the Bible alone. So let us pray, even as we continue to discuss our Sabbath school lesson of this Sabbath being chapter number 15, the Holy Spirit of God. Let's believe as we pray. Eternal Father, we thank you so much for this Holy Sabbath day and even for allowing us once again to be in this holy house on the Sabbath. For man to keep the Sabbath, since the Sabbath is holy, you also call us to be holy, not through our strength and might, but through the grace of Christ. And only a holy man can keep a holy Sabbath. We are before you this morning pleading that you may forgive us all our sins, and even as we be in this holy Sabbath day, may your will alone prevail in our lives. As we look at the Sabbath school lesson, the Holy Spirit of God teach us this morning. May your will alone prevail as you lead us till the end. It's our prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, beloved, we can now continue. Uh, this is a wonderful book for you to study and understand the foundations of our faith. 160 years of Christology in Adventism. And you've re you'll realize that much has been lost sight of that we need to be acquainted with if uh, we are to be true Adventists. 
who were to proclaim the everlasting gospel, even the three angels' messages. And uh, from the banner here, you can clearly see the proclamation of the three angels' messages. We have been laboring to once again restore us to who God is. And we've looked at the Father. We've looked at His Son, Christ Jesus. And today, God has permitted us now to explore and study more about the Holy Spirit of God. So today is our privilege to learn more about the Holy Spirit of God so that we can avoid the confusion that is in the world. Where the world today has made their third God and they are worshipping a third being which is not there. And our fellowship, we are told, is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if we miss this mark, beloved, we are going to worship that which is not God. Without a clear understanding of who the Spirit is, the position of the Spirit, the office of the Spirit of God, then we are going to find ourselves worshipping another God. The controversy that you realize that God is having with these children in this final house of this earth history is that they know not about God. Let me just open this with a verse in the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter number 15. This is Second Chronicles chapter number 15 allow me read verses number 3 now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a, a teaching priest and without law so we are told for a very long time the children of God have not been worshipping the only true God the knowledge of one true God, the knowledge of His Son Jesus Christ, is life eternal. And in connection to this, we also need not to say that so we only believe in the Father and the Son. What about the Spirit? That is what we are laboring to share with us in this our today's Sabbath school. And uh, I've told you, and I will still remind us that look for this book it is called. The foundation of our faith on 60 years of Christology in Adventism by Alan Stamp, the Spirit of God. Now, what are we to learn about the Spirit of God? What do you need to know? As we lay the foundation, I know the first thing that we need to ask ourselves. What is the meaning of the Spirit of God? That is the meaning that I would wish to begin with so that we continue to learn more about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. Let me read a statement here. I made some leaflets here to help us understand this concept. And uh, I believe it is going to be profitable in our lives this morning. Let me read a statement here. And today we are only going to look at biblical understanding of the Spirit of God. We will continue to explore more. And uh, we have the comment section. You can send your questions and even your comments and your concerns so that we can be grounded upon biblical truths that will earn us eternal life. We are told that even the pioneers understood clearly what the Spirit is. But today we're not going to understand, to, to look into what they understood about the Spirit of God. But this is what I have to introduce to us. We are told God's Spirit was never understood <clears throat> to represent an entity separate and alone. It says that this man, the pioneers of God, understood that when God gives men of his spirit, he is giving them of his very life. 
and is not sending a separate entity as a substitute in his place. So when we are talking about the Spirit of God, even the pioneers that we will consider some later time, they understood that this is not another being. The Spirit is not the third being. It's not a third being. We have God as a being, His Son as a being, and their Spirit. This is the concept that we all need to understand as God's children. For we have been worshipping Satan for long. We need to worship God. We need to understand and have a true knowledge of the Father and the Son and their spirits. So what about the spirits? What do we need to know about the spirit of God? The meaning of the spirits. Take this concept home. It says the word spirit appears to many as a rather vague term. People do not understand the spirit. The problem is compounded by the translators of the King James Version using ghost. So we hear the term Holy Ghost in King James Version. But they should not confuse anyone. We are told, let us first look at the term spirit. So we are going to look at the spirit in the Old Testament. As it is translated in Hebrew and also in Greek. This is not theology but a simple concept that everyone must understand how the spirit is used in the old testament and how it is translated in both hebrew and greek so simple so we are going to look at some three terms here used to refer to the spirit of god but the first concept that I would wish that we have in our hearts and let it sink in that the Spirit is the Spirit of God, not another being, not another uh, entity from the Son and even from the Father. We are told that the word Spirit in Hebrew is translated is translated ruach so you realize that in hebrew the word spirit is translated ruach r u w a c h what does this mean if you go to the strong concordance if you go to strong concordance this word ruach is defined as wind by resemblance breath that is a sensible exhalation figuratively life anger and by extension a region of the sky so you'll realize that uh, in uh, hebrew the word spirit is translated work which in strong concordance is defined as breath and uh, wind, so it is likened to this, and we are told that uh, other translators, when defining this Hebrew term ruach to mean the spirit of God, they translate it as hair, hunger, blast. Mark those words, for as we get now to the Bible. We are going to look at in the Old Testament when the Spirit has been used either as hair, as breath, as blast, cool, courage, mind, quarter, side, tempest, wind, wild wind. So our other translators will also define the word work to mean the Spirit of God as breath, as blast, and in the book of Job, this one is going to be clear to us. How the spirit has been translated. That word ruach, defined as hair, breath, blast, wind, wild wind, mind. How I wish that we don't forget those terms to avoid confusion. We are continuing. And I believe no one is lost. Now, as we 
want now to enter into the Bible and look at this word spirit. But let this one sink in. It says that the majority of cases involving ruach relate to breath or life. A word close, closely related to this word ruach in Hebrew that is also used synonymously to mean the same thing as we are going to discover from several verses in the Old Testament. This other word that also means the same as ruach, the spirit of God. And mean is translated breath is called neshama. So we have ruach and neshama. And these two words, listen to this, neshama is used in Genesis chapter number 2 verses number 7. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 verses number 7. And you're going to discover something there. In Genesis chapter number 2 verses number 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostril the breath. That word breath in Genesis chapter 2 verses number 7 in Hebrew is translated neshama of life, and man became a living soul. So, in Genesis chapter 2, verses number 7, an aspect of the Spirit of God is brought to us. And in that case, it is translated the breath of life. That word breath of life in Hebrew is translated as neshama. So, beloved, that is a simple concept that you need to understand. Neshama is also twice translated spirit and soul once. Neshama is used interchangeably with ruach, as we're going to discover. So most verses, uh, there is what we call Hebrew parallelism. A word is used to represent the other. And uh, in this our case, you realize that when we have a word used as neshama in one point, in the same text, it is, it is again translated in ruach, but they mean the same thing. And we are handling the spirit of God. Listen to this. <clears throat> How are we going to explore this Hebrew parallelism? Let us now consider this series of verses to help us understand this concept of ruach. And the other translation of the word ruach is neshama, to mean breath. And that breath of life will mean the Spirit of God, which is not another entity, not another being from the Father and the Son. It is their Spirit, as we'll discover this, as we continue to learn about the foundation of our faith, 160 years of Christology in Adventism. The book of Job, chapter number 4. If you're following, you go to Job, chapter number 4, verses number 9. It reads, by the blast. Remember I told you that the word work in strong concordance is defined as blast, breath, hair, wind, wild wind. So when Job is talking about a blast, that is the spirit of God. I notice this translation here, by the blast, that is now neshama of God they perish, and by the breath, ruach. So Hebrew parallelism, blast and breath, to mean the same thing. When they use the word blast, it means neshama, translated neshama in Hebrew. And that same word has been used in the same text to mean breath, translated ruach. So it says, by the blast of God, neshama, they perish, and by the breath, ruach, of his nostrils are they consumed. Job 4, verses number 9. Job 27, verses number 3. The same appears. And verses number 3, the Bible says, All the while my breath, that is now Neshama, is in me. And the spirit, ruach, translated ruach, of God is in my nostrils. So in 
most of the text in Job, when the spirit is mentioned, we are also seeing blast and breath. But it means the same thing. That is what we, we call Hebrew parallelism. The Hebrew parallelism helps us to understand this concept so well. So friends, as we explore and look at the meaning of the Spirit of God, you realize that it has been translated Ruach. And that same word Ruach is also translated to mean the same thing, Neshama. And in Hebrew parallelism, we've even tried to look at this in now two texts. Let us now explore again in the third one. This is now Job chapter 33, verses number 4. So in the book of Job, it is clear. When you are handling the Spirit of God, it is clear in Job chapter number, in, in most of the chapters in the book of Job. In the book of Job chapter 33, verses number 4, we are told the Spirit, that is now translated work, of God made me. And the breath, Neshama, it is now translated in that case, Neshama, of God, or of the Almighty, hath given me life. So you are now seeing the concept of Hebrew parallelism. But it means the same thing. That is the concept that I would wish us to have and let it sink in. That Hebrew parallelism. It means the same thing. And when someone is using Hebrew parallelism to expound on a concept, then beloved, let it sink in. That is what we call Hebrew parallelism. Now, Another aspect that I will also wish us to consider as we look into the Holy Spirit of God is how the Spirit is related to the mind, the Spirit and the mind. Don't lose focus on this, the Spirit and the mind. And uh, in this case, we're now going to look at the Greek translation of the word Spirit. It says the Greek word usually translated as Spirit is pneuma. It is defined in strong concordance as current of air, breath, in bracket blast, or a breeze. And um, this is what we also need to understand. That both Ruach and Numa carry the concept of mind or intellect. In both, you will hear the word mind. And how can the spirit be separated from the mind? A concept that you also need to understand the spirit and the mind. Now, a wonderful text here in the Old Testament that also appears in the New Testament will help us expound on this and understand more on how the spirit can be understood and how the spirit and mind are used interchangeably. In the book Isaiah chapter 40 verses number 13, Listen to this. This is now in the Old Testament, and the same text will appear in the New Testament, but now in another sense, to give us the relationship between the spirit and the mind. Today we're just comparing. After learning the meaning of the spirit, we now want to look at the spirit and the mind. And after the spirit and the mind, we are also going to learn more about the spirit's as explained and uh, how the words are spirit and then we just stop at that point we'll continue to explore more on this so that we come to a point of realizing that friends we have the father the son and their spirit and that spirit is not another entity that spirit is not another being if we are worshiping the third being in the trinity doctrine then that is satan himself for he had said that he will rise in the north. In the north, in the sanctuary language, we have the table of shewbread. And there we're only seeing two stacks. If that one represents the throne of God, where we have the throne of the Father and the Son. If we are also having the third being, then it means Satan is also having his throne. And that is the Trinity doctrine. That is falsehood. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of God. Not another entity will explain this so that we can learn about the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit and the Mind. Book of Isaiah chapter 40 verses number 13. Listen to this. It says, 
who hath directed the spirit, Ruach, translated Ruach in Hebrew, of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him. Now, if you read the book of Romans chapter 11, verses number 34, having the same verse, but what changes there is uh, the use of the spirit. In this case, listen to what the Bible says. For who hath known the mind? In Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13, it was about the spirit. For who has known the mind of God? So we need not to confuse them, the spirit and the mind. So we are told, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, the same text. What has been used there interchangeably is the spirit and the mind. And how can the, your spirit be separated from your mind? Impossibility. That is so simple. Let us also consider uh, another text to help us understand on that point. Listen to an admonition from Paul to the Colossians and also to the Corinths, touching on the mind and the spirit. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verses number 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am high with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So Paul is saying, I'm with you in spirit, though I'm absent in the flesh. But that one doesn't mean that another Paul is with them and Paul is present in another place. No, in his mind. And that is what we normally refer to. Though I'm not with you there physically, I am with you, you are in my mind doesn't mean I am with you there physically and I am also present where I am physically. That will be falsehood. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 5, verses number 3. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit. In my mind, I am present there. I am remembering you. You are in my mind. So friends, that one doesn't mean now that we have another entity. Let us look at how the words are related to the spirit. Words express the concepts of the mind. This is what we normally know. That out of the abundance of the mind, the mouth speaks. So we'll always express what is in the mind. And listen to this powerful verse in John chapter 6, verses number 6 to 3. He said, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So words are also likened to the spirit. The words you speak, they are not distinct and separate from yourself. That is not another self of yours. They are your words. And words are like it to the spirit. It's only in that text. See also Proverbs chapter 1 verses number 23. It says, Turn you at my reproof. And in this case, the Hebrew parallelism. The word spirit is used to mean the word. Proverbs 1.23 says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words. The spirit and the mind cannot be separated. The words are spirits. That one is just enough to explain to us 
that the spirit cannot be another being, another entity, other than from the mind of God, the words of God. We are still going to explore this. Let me not rush. But just explaining some simple concept on the spirit, how it is related to the mind, and how it is related to the word. Allow me to finalize. I will not wish to keep you so much in, into this, but we will continue to explore. And uh, God is present everywhere, not physically. We, we are not expecting to see God everywhere, but He's present everywhere through His Spirit. Even from that alone, you come to a point of asking yourself, is the Spirit is a being? I know we cannot limit the Spirit, but if it was a being, how will it be present in Africa? How will that Spirit physically be present again in Europe and other continents? No, this is not another entity, another being, but it is the Spirit of God. We'll look at how it is manifested. And um, there's also an aspect that I will not wish to forget here. Let me also look at God being omnipresent. The omnipresence of God. How is God omnipresent? Present everywhere. Listen to this. Even though God has a bodily presence, it is by His Spirit that God can be omnipresent. So God is omnipresent by His Spirit. Not physically. <clears throat> and David explains this in the book of Psalms, chapter 139, verses number 7 and 8. When he says, <clears throat> Whither shall I go from thy Spirit? from thy spirit or whither shall life flee from thy presence if I ascend up into heaven thou art there if I make my bed in hell behold thou art there so God you are present everywhere I cannot hide but not physically by your spirit which is not another entity from yourself So we also see an Hebrew parallelism where the spirit is used interchangeably with the presence of God. Now, I said we are only looking at the spirit of God from the word. And today we've not gone much. We've only explored how the spirit is used in the Old Testament. And the Hebrew parallelism, the Ruach, the Neshama, and the Neuma, to mean the same thing, blast, breath, wind, wild wind. And how the spirit is related to the mind, how the spirit is related to the word, how the words are spirit. This will be interesting if we take our time and explore more and much concerning uh, how we need to understand the Spirit of God. Now, when Christ said that the Spirit of God is upon him, listen to this, that Jesus said that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he had been anointed to preach the gospel. Jesus was set up, anointed for everlasting. The very time Christ means the anointed one. That is right. Now listen to this. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That is Philippians chapter 2 verses number 5. The mind or spirit that was in Christ was the mind or the spirit of the Father. So we cannot separate this. You cannot be separated from your mind. That one will become useless. Mindless, spiritless. 
So you cannot be separated from your mind. You cannot be separated from your spirit as an individual. And Paul had already explained this to us. So beloved, as we'll continue to explore more on the spirit of the Lord, the concept that I would wish to bring to our minds this morning in this our Sabbath school le uh, lesson is that we cannot separate God from his spirit. And uh, the spirit is not another being. We have God as a being, a personal being. He signed Jesus Christ as a personal being and their spirit expressed in words we've seen and we've also seen the relationship between the mind and the spirit cannot be separated. We've learned simple lesson today. As we'll continue in chapter number 16, I know God is going to show us more about the spirit and what we need to understand about the spirit of the Father, which is also the spirit of His Son. May God bless us as we continue to be in this Holy Sabbath day and uh, let it be a challenge to us that we sink deep in the Word of God and study more to explore and to understand the will of the Father. God bless you. Let us pray as we mark it tonight. Father Divine, we thank you so much because you love us. May your will be done even as we continue to be in this Holy Sabbath day. Thank you so much for allowing us to learn that truly the Spirit is not another being, that the Spirit is of the Father and also of the Son. And there is a relationship between the Spirit and the mind that is inseparable. And your words are also a Spirit. In John 6, 63, that it is the Spirit only that quickeneth, the flesh perfect at nothing. The words that you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. The very life of the Father is the spirit and cannot be separated from him. May this truth sink deep in our hearts as we continue to learn this. Thank you so much for your love. May your will be done. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Blessings and have uh, a wonderful Sabbath.